Hello, KGC Show. This is your host. And um, I wanted to bring to you guys today a, a different side of KGC. Uh, I, I, as you guys know, I'm musically inclined, but I love comedy as just as much as I love music. And and I thought, you know, I need to get a guest on who, who knows best, the best of both worlds. And so I called or my buddy called me up and he said, hey, I got this guy and his name is Dave Higby. Welcome to the show, Dave. Hey, it's nice to meet you. Glad to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. And it's an honor for me to have you on the show. And you first started your career in music. Talk to us a little bit about how you got into that music. Wow. The long and winding road. All right. Um, I mean, really, I started out, I was kind of in college down in San Diego and I wrote for magazines. I wrote for the Tower Records magazine, which was a record chain kind of worldwide for quite a while. Um, I wrote for Rip magazine, which was like a heavy metal magazine and Rock Beat, which was kind of its little sister magazine. And uh, I mean, interviews with anyone from like Metallica to Pearl Jam, Rat, X, The Blasters, a uh, guy named Mojo Nixon was always a favorite of mine. He was a local San Diegan, and now you can hear him on uh, on Outlaw Country on Sirius XM. He's got a little show on there right now. So that was kind of my start. And, um, you know, at a certain point, I moved to L.A. to work in film and television. Uh, but my first couple of years were kind of lean and I was still writing for magazines and whatnot. And then um, the kind of, it was kind of that a lot of people point to Nirvana and the, the whole grunge thing. And that kind of collapsed a big part of the music industry that I was kind of writing about. And uh, at that point, I just kind of made my move over laterally into kind of television and film, which was why I actually came to Los Angeles in the first place. So so in the business, your nickname is Doobie Dave. Can you tell us how that name came to be about? Uh, don't usually give that away, but uh, let's just say I'm a fan of the Doobie Brothers, all there right? You know, that, uh, that is Trying right. to grow, digging into the streets. Jesus is just all right, you know? It's uh, all good stuff. Good, good group. It's funny you know that, though. Oh, boy. Yeah, uh, I have I have my ways, you know. I'm a I'm a <laughs> you know, when did you when did you get into comedy? Uh well, I mean picking it up when I kind of got into film and television production. Um I started working at uh, MTV and um at that point I was mainly dealing with a lot of the award shows and the concert specials and spring breaks and what what they call in the business multi-camera television it's it's uh like a tv commercial or a music video might use one maybe two cameras a concert or an event might use anywhere from you know 10 to 20 cameras it's a whole different animal as far as that goes and uh so i just kind of was in the the music side of that, I mean, I worked on concerts for Ozzy Osbourne, Melissa Etheridge, Sammy Hagar, uh, Herbie Hancock on the jazzy side there. And um, Fleetwood Mac was another big one when I was at MTV. Um, and the recent passing of Christine McVie, God bless. She was an amazing talent there. But um so, I would, you know, I did a lot of work on the music side of things. I was like production managing, I moved up to line producing, really got a full grasp of the process. I sat in on a lot of edits with some big name directors and kind of absorbed their craft and how they cut shows and put them together. And uh, was just kind of cruising along in that music world. And then uh, a friend of mine, Alan Blomquist, who was actually a uh, producer, executive producer for the Blue Collar, comedy franchise was uh putting a deal together for various artists to do cds and dvds and whatever and he called me up and said how would you like to do comedy you know and 
I had a little experience prior to that. I did um, Latin Kings of Comedy with George Lopez and Paul Rodriguez and Cheech Marin. And uh, so I knew a little bit about comedy and, you know, like, uh, like one thing we're talking about it the other day, it's really like when you're dealing with musicians and you've got bands and there may be five or six people and kind of diverging personalities um, when you're filming them, you know, the bass player says, oh, the drummer got more shots than I did, or the singer got more shots than anybody, which you would expect. But there's kind of a, a pecking order and who gets the most shots and when you're filming music. And when I had the opportunity, opportunity to do comedy, it was like one guy with a microphone, you know, let's do it. You know, I mean, it was it was a much simpler coverage scenario but you're still dealing with the multiple cameras and the microphones and everything else that kind of goes into putting a show together talk to us a little bit about some of the artists that you got to work with and um and we'll come back to that blue collar comedy tour because i want to talk about that for a minute but before we go deeper into the blue collar guys i want to know who are some of the people that you've worked with that you've just gotten to say wow i've gotten to work with uh you know George Lopez or something like that. Oh well, yeah, I did work with George Lopez. It was kind of indirectly at that time, but um, I mean, it's I've kind of have a parallel path in production. I've produced a lot of shows and I've directed not quite as many shows. So I mean, on on the producing side, uh, you know, Henry Cho, Ralphie May. Um, you know, gosh, numerous people. Um, Russell Peters, which is how I met Russell Peters. I produced his first uh, outsourced DVD back in 2006. And he was just kind of breaking out on YouTube. He's actually one of the first comedians to actually kind of go, as they say, viral on YouTube. And um, he was picking up a following and we ended up filming a show in san francisco at the time and kind of it went from there but uh on the directing side uh lisa lampanelli russell peters billy gardell um steve trevino uh gosh is a, you can look on my imdb uh, it's a good place to kind of see everything i did and sometimes i need to reference it myself just to see where i'm at but uh yeah and then you know on the on, on the producing side you know, produced three Larry the Cable Guy Christmas specials, two Larry the Cable Guy stand-up specials, um, produced an Engvall special, 15 Degrees Off Cool, directed um, an Engvall special. Uh, God, I can't figure the title out, but it's somewhere in there. Yeah. But, you know, check the IMDB and you can check me on my math here and we'll see where I'm at. So. Yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit about when you were approached with the blue collar comedy tour, what at the time that you were approached with directing and helping that production, did you know that it was going to be as big as it was? And when, when it got as big as it was, what was your reaction to that? Did you know it was something there? Uh, I mean, I got brought into the picture after they had done the first special in, in Washington, DC and um yeah i mean it was just gangbusters at that point i mean i think the political environment at that time in the country was kind of lent itself to that kind of comedy and that you know that just blue collar lifestyle and it, it it was as big a hit as they expected it to be i mean the management team had a really good pulse of what was happening in the comedy world and what was happening in middle america and i think a big part of what they were going for was that they wanted to do comedy for not New York and not Los Angeles. They wanted comedy for the middle. They felt like there was a whole spectrum of the country that was being overlooked in the comedy world. And, uh, you know, they targeted Blue Collar and they, they did the DVDs and that drove the tours and they went out in the middle America and they they made a killing literally they made more money than you'd ever want so <laughs> you know and, and i want to you know along the way that you were 
around the MTV era, you met a really good, great guy. His name is Jeff Panzer. What is oh, Jeff's yeah. friendship? What is Jeff's friendship to you, meant? I mean, it's been a lot. It's been, uh, you know, a quite a uh, colorful, sorted path, as we might even say, you know, as the Grateful Dead would say, the long, strange trip. Uh, which it literally started my first day with him at VH1. He was doing VH1 News, and uh, I walked in, and it was the day Jerry Garcia died. And, you know, Jeff was not only a friend of Jerry's, but he was also a news guy. And so this was like the perfect storm that I walked into on my first day, and suddenly it was you know, obit obituary packages and other packages on the Grateful Dead and, you know, everything, all things Grateful Dead and all things Jerry Garcia that first week. And from there, Jeff and I formed a, quite a relationship and he moved on into the, you know, actually went back into the record business and back to his home of just making music videos and being the emperor of all videos that he is known as and uh kind of just followed him into that a little bit i filmed a lot of behind the scenes for various artists on his music videos um the cash money record stuff in the early days nelly um three doors down blue october like various artists and Jeff kind of took me through all that and you know we've just become great friends you know almost inseparable over these many years so yes and Good shout people. out to Jeff uh Jeff Panzer he's he's yes. helped me out uh in so many more ways than one and I just love Jeff and and love what he brings to the table and we got to get him back on for another episode of the podcast but wrapping yeah, this yeah. wrap up, wrap, wrapping up the show man I I got to ask you one last question uh is there any stories that you can tell working with any of the artists that you worked with that you would be feel uncomfortable and that my podcast listeners would enjoy? Well, I mean, there's a story in Las Vegas with an intern in a tuxedo jacket, but that's probably, you know, not where it's appropriate for the podcast audience. But uh, I could say that um, there was a time we, we I produced – Larry the Cable Guy's tailgate party. It, it was, uh, gosh, like, you know, maybe 2008, 2009. And we were filming in a stadium in Lincoln, Nebraska, Husker Stadium, GBR people, go big red. And uh, although they're not doing all that great, but I'm <laughs> still sentimental for them. But filming the show, you know, 50,000 people in the audience had spent days setting up and it's a whole logistical feat to kind of make something like that happen. And we filmed the show and afterwards, Larry walking around out front, just kind of soaking it all in and people are taking the chairs down and taking the lights down and kind of putting the whole show to bed. And uh, Larry says, you won't believe this, but I woke up this morning and I forgot my entire set. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like I, he's like, I couldn't remember anything to do with my comedy routine, any of the jokes, any of the setups, any of it. He's like, I just completely blanked on it. And um, I'm like, well, when, when were you going to tell us that? And apparently he wasn't going to tell us that. But he took it all the way till he said it was... He was standing on the in the wings on the side of the stage. We're filming. There's one show only. And... His opening act, Reno Collier, is out there doing his act. And he said he heard Reno doing his set. And that triggered his memory lapse. And it all came back probably within 10 minutes of us starting the film. But finally, he got, you know, we had a shot a spectacular show for 90 minutes or so. And he had a great time. And the audience loved it. But, yeah, we were that close to just, like, cable guy going out there with not a joke in his head. And... I don't know what we would have done. So, shout out to Larry the Cable Guy. We love you, buddy, and uh, hope to get yeah, you a guest. Get, get her done. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. That is uh that's one of Larry's greatest lines, and I love you, Larry. Thank you, Dave, guys, so much for watching the show. 
Uh, th big thanks, huge thanks to Dave, uh, Dave Higby, and uh, Dave, thank you so much for being on the show, and I hope you enjoyed your time, man. Uh, my pleasure, man. I'd like to give a shout out to our friend Jeff and our friend William Lee Golden and Danny Stefanetti, and you know, yes, all, the, all Jeff's uh, posse that I also you know been introduced to you as well so yes. thanks for having me and uh look forward to uh talking more down the road yes sir and also uh make sure to check out danny stefanetti's danny speaking uh on facebook live um 4 30 pacific standard time 7 30 eastern and um 6 30 standard and um we love you danny congratulations on all your success and thank you guys so much Thank you. Thank you.